Hello. So for today, I have got an interestingly different book that I am going to be reviewing. I almost don't feel like I need to review this book. It was so impressive and it left such an impression on me. I'm going to hang on to it. I'm going to read it again. The chances of me forgetting it, I feel are quite low. But anyway, here we go. The Flanders Panel by, let me see if I can pronounce this correctly, Arturo Perez Reverte. Reverte? Probably. So, I don't speak Spanish. The author is Spanish, and apparently he's really well known. I hadn't heard of him myself, but this particular one, The Flanders Panel, is a best has been a bestseller in Spain and in France. He started, the author started as a novelist, he started as a, before he was a novelist, he was a journalist, and he's been writing, I believe, since the 90s. The Flanders panel impressed me in the op shop where I came across it because it's got an art link. And I myself love painting in the background. As an honour, I've put one of my paintings, which demonstrates clearly that I have not a single touch of Flemish artistry in me and I'm much more of an Impressionist, nay, even a Forbist. But anyway, this one, because I love art, I love painting, and that means that I love reading about it. But reading about art is a tricky one. Not many people really have the ability to write about art because it's so much an internal experience. What you can write is you can write history, and I've got a few of those. You can write about the life of the artist. I've got a few books, letters um, by Van Gogh and so forth. Having art as part of a novel is tricky, and it's usually restricted to art heists or crime or something like that. Some of those are great, but... So the Flanders panel, um, does, it des describes on the back Julia, our main character, Ah, uh, no, you know what? This description is pretty terrible. I don't understand how I... Anyway, never mind. I was really ready for this book because even though it's what I tend to think of as normal fiction being neither fantasy nor, nor science fiction, which are my more normal flavours of reading, I'd read a lot in those genres reading. I was suffering from reader's fatigue. I needed a change of pace and normal fiction seemed to be a change of pace. I was also rather over reading young adult. I wanted something that was adult, fully adult, and I don't mean having sex and violence, I mean having adult concepts and a rich descriptive life. And this book had all of this and it was perfection for what I needed. So the writing is beautiful, the translation is also, I guess, beautiful. Who is the translator? Let's mention her here. The tra translated from the Spanish by Margaret Jules Costa. So I can't read the Spanish, but I reckon Jules Costa did an amazing job with this because it is lush, velvety, rich. It's beautiful to read. Um, the characters are interesting. They're diverse and they're almost intoxicatingly beautifully described. They're each one of them quite unique in a different way, but they're fascinating. Not necessarily people that you'd want to be best friends with, but fascinating and incredibly easy to determine between the two. You know how some books you'll have be given a huge range of characters. Shortly afterwards, you're not sure who you're talking, who the text is talking about because you've been given too many and not enough distinction between them. In this book, every single character is beautifully distinct and as unique as a precious diamond. The setting of the book was Madrid, which I thought was fantastic. It's great to get away from your tried and true American city type background backdrops. And I haven't myself been to Madrid. It wasn't heavy on Madrid. There was just enough of a sense of place that I think someone who had been there would enjoy it. And I, would, could, I could have done with a bit more of the Prado Museum. By the way, I, that's one thing I want, really want to see in Madrid. Anyway, but yes, character, writing, settings, all the boxes ticked. Beautiful. Actually, in terms of the enjoyment that I got from reading this as a book in English, but with 
flavor from a different culture, a different country, a different language, the sort of enjoyment I got here was the enjoyment that I expected to get about get from Gabriel Garcia Marquez's writing and which I've spectacularly failed to get so far. I find I find Marquez's writing to be honest tedious. It tries too hard where this seems effortless. So yes, as I was saying earlier, I got this book for its art connections. And the book starts with Julia. No matter what it says on the back of the cover, what Julia actually is, is an export bird restorer of old paintings. She is also apparently a painter in her own right, but we never see any aspect of that, of that part of Julia. We only ever see her restoring paintings. And it starts with a very specific painting from the 15th century, a masterpiece that has been in a private collection for a very long time and is now about to be put up for sale by a particular art sales house um, but it's being marketed by her friend who is getting her to do the restoration. The painting is called the Flanders Panel. We get the a bit of the history of the Flanders Panel and how that may not have been its original name and the book describes beautifully the actual scene in the painting which anyone who's spent much time looking at Flemish painting or the old Dutch masters so easy to imagine it describes in the foreground you've got two men one dressed as a knight one as a lord sitting over a chessboard and describes their clothes it describes their postures it describes everything the back the background has a floor that is black and white check so it's a kind of a reflection of the chest and in the background a woman sits which is wearing a black gown like morning and she's reading a book in her lap so her eyes are downturned the description of the painting was so marvelous um, and it ties in with the plot so uniquely i actually went online to see if it was a real painting conclusion seems to be no there is no such painting and the artist that is being described as having painted it Van Huys, I think it's the the name is given as uh, Van Huys, yes there is actually an artist called Van Huys if I'm even pronouncing that correctly it's V-A-N space H-U-Y-S there is an artist by that name but he painted about a century later and he didn't paint Flemish traditional style. He painted much more like, I don't know, Velasquez? No, Bruegel. Bruegel. Um, those tortured landscapes and visions of hell and heavenly delights and things like that. He sounds like a great artist, by the way, but he isn't the artist described in this book. There's some contention about that online, but no, this painting doesn't seem to be a painting that's real. The Flanders panel. While it obviously borrows from many paintings out there that are real, it itself is not a real painting and the history that has been ascribed to it is not a real history, though it very easily could be. It isn't. So Julie is restoring this painting and as part of her restoration she has UV light uh, imagery done on it and she finds that there is a hidden message in Latin around the table on which the chess game is being played and it, it, the translation is who killed the knight and that starts her on this big journey of historical exploration of the history behind um, the chess game and the painting in general. So the research is fascinating and in the process of investigating the question, dead bodies in the here and now start popping up. People that she knows around her are dying. And finally, she and her... Is he... I'll protect, I, think, I think he must have been her guardian at one stage, but now she's adult, she's just her friend. They go out to find a person who's um, good at chess and can find, because they both feel that the chess game in the painting is the key to solving the historical mystery. Once, after, after that has started, it stops being about discovering the historical mystery of who actually killed the knight, 
the knight being one of the two players in the painting. But then who in the here and now is killing and what are they doing it for? It's a really enticing mystery rather than exciting. The pacing is slow and deliberate and beautifully elaborate. But you aren't going to find yourself page turning. You're going to find yourself wanting to linger over every beautiful phrase because of the beauty of the writing. Now, I did get it for the art. And as the ascendancy of the chess game as part of solving the mystery game instruction, the art sort of goes down and I missed having more art. Also, I don't play, play chess and the ascendancy of the chess over the art, honestly, it didn't bother me as much as it could have because the writing was so beautiful and the story became interesting and multifocal. I would have, this may be more your cup, more your cup of tea if you're into chess than if you're into art is what I'm trying to say here. Now, spoiler. Is it, is it really a spoiler? I think it kind of might be that I don't see how this could be truly a spoiler. So they're using a chess master, a master player of chess to solve this game. And then the murderer keeps leaving these little cards of the next move and their chess person responds to them. But by page 196, when I was suffering from chess overdose, I paused, and it wasn't for the first time, it was just for the most deliberate time, to wonder how the hell did they think that their moves were getting to the murderer? The murderer was playing them. There were attempts at Julia's life, people dropping like flies, whatever. But, and they, they'd get a little card with a chess move. And then they'd get together and they'd decide on the next move. Now, because I don't really know chess and wasn't really following it all, but it seemed to me like the murderer was responding to their moves. At no point, however, does the author tell you how they're getting their move to the murderer. Right? So we're talking about one from the 90s. They're not posting it on Snapchat. Somehow the murderer knows their moves. But then we haven't been told how. They're not describing how. This surely is a huge plot gap. Because if there's only three or four of them sitting around planning the move that they're going to respond to the murderers with, and they're not getting it to the murder anyway, then obviously the murder has to be one of those four sitting around the table, right? That's not, that's not even a spoiler. Were we even meant to be surprised at the great reveal at the end? There was not really very much, there wasn't anywhere for that to go really. So at the end of the day, that was a bit disappointing. The art inferences being lost was a little bit not what I'd hoped for, but again, not too bad. Um, at the end of the day, beautifully written. Whatever thoughts I might have about the thriller element, I will almost certainly reread this, and I'm kept, kept keeping my hands on this uh, copy because it is beautiful. I will want to reread it again. And that's my non science fiction for the month, I guess. <laughs>